Hello, everyone. Happy Friday. Thank you for joining our local peace economy conversation today. And this moment where, you know, I say the resistance to oppression always throughout history and around the globe is community. So I say, you know, we start here together in our form of resistance to authoritarianism, to the war economy, to the oppression and extraction that it is to the earth and to our lives um, also, as we've, um, as we watch the world respond in the ways it does <clears throat> to all of that. So I just, you know, I wanna do a quick uh, little catch up for everyone on what the local peace economy is. I know some of you are, you know, core parts of our community. Some of you I see here who are building local peace economies in your community. Um, <clears throat> so the local peace economy came out of the work of Could Pink, um, actually during uh, when Obama got elected. And it was that deep understanding that we can't end war until we end the war economy because the war economy uh, is what the war serves. Uh, when you look at wars, uh, they are, it is the war economy that um, they're in service to. That's when you're confused about what's happening and why that doesn't make sense. It's clearly that. And so if there's a war economy, which is extractive, destructive, and oppressive, what can we do as peace activists? Well, the first is to recognize we live in a war economy. And, um, and that's some practice, that's some work to literally recognize that we are part of it, that we serve it, um, that uh, we, um, uh, we are used by it, our hearts and minds are used by it. And so uh, what, are the, what are the ways the war economy uses us and how can we pivot away from that? And I say build the arc to get us through all the disasters the war economy has created, which is the peace economy, which is a local grounded in community peace economy that serves the needs of the people because those are not being served. Uh, by the culture of the war economy, by the war economy itself. And we we know that story. I don't need to repeat it, but um, we are also in a time where war and the weapons that have been created by it um, that have made the rich richer are devastating our hearts every day. And another reason to be in community is in community, working together, being together, being human in relationship, is how we can keep sane and move through this time um, where we're watching the war economy on steroids in ways that I say the psyche is not equipped to handle. Um, so, you know, I'm super excited about today and having this conversation because the whole framing of the war economy and peace economy is into a story so that we can have a relationship with it and find how it can be useful to us. And um, I have like one of my favorite people on the planet as our guest today. And, um, you know, it's, stories can serve us, they can use us, they can liberate us, um, but stories are part of being human. They're, you know, around the campfire, we told stories from for millennia. Uh, it is our connective tissue um, and they can be co-opted and they can be used by people for power, for greed, um, or they can liberate us and help also build the fabric of a peaceful society. So um, my guest today, um, Charles Eisenstein is, um, you know, is a human <laughs> that I admire because he takes on the questions, you know, as a philosopher, as the person who 
is so confounded by the questions that he spends his day in his life in the examining of them, in the unpacking of them, in the, um, you know, what is unspoken, what is unconscious, what is under us, our culture that, you know, runs our lives. And um, how does he help us not only see them, but, um, you know, he's he's a writer and, and a speaker and the and the things he writes and speaks about is what does he discover in this exploration and two of my very favorite books of his many books are sacred economics and the more beautiful world our hearts know is possible and so when the war economy is using us in all ways and uh literally hooking our hearts and minds for its use uh charles is what I say is a liberator. Um, and, and in the liberation from these things that grab us and hold us and where we think that's all there is, um, Charles uh, always being in his presence is that exploration into how can we be liberated and how then can we be engaged in a story that brings peace and beauty and happiness and fulfillment and allows us to be human in ways that are relational. So I want to invite Charles. Um, uh, hi, Jody. I'm here. Hi, Charles. Thank you. Thank you so hi. much for joining us today. Um, mm -hmm. I also just want to tell everyone, you were a big influence for me as I was trying to cultivate the question of the war economy and the peace economy. And, you know, reading your books were core to like building you know, new neurons in my own brain and psyche. Um, so I just want to say your your uh, soil nourishment uh, nutrient to, to this work. Um, so one of the well, core roots with that uh, this work stands on. So thanks to, for joining today. Well, I'm very humbled and honored to, to be with you um, and with the Code Pink community. Um, yeah. Thank what you. you were saying, you know, you, you were mentioning in our earlier conversation how the psyche is just not equipped to fully countenance everything that's happening as as a result of what you're calling the war economy. Um, you know, I like even me personally, I just if I even touch on it, you know, if I even touch on what it must be like to actually be someone right now living in, you know, Palestine or Haiti, you know, Gaza, the DRC, um, any one, any number of Ukraine, you know, any number of these war areas, I can only touch it for a moment, you know, before it becomes overwhelming. And so I really understand why people shield themselves with stories so as not to fully feel it. So as to be like, well, you know, it's okay because they had it coming to them, or it's okay because, well, it's not really happening, it's, it's being fake, or um, it's okay because it's for a good cause, or things, these, you know, all, any number of stories that it's not just about rationalizing or justifying or making your side right. There's a deeper aspect to it that is about our capacity to feel. And I'm not even saying it's a bad thing to shield ourselves sometimes, you know? I mean, I, I I can't be feeling it all the time, all day, to the exclusion of feeling the, uh, you know, ecstasy of the dolphins and, the, and then the birds and the ants, you know? I mean, there's a lot to feel here. Um, but I just think that right now, given the state of our lives, not just the state of the planet, it's not just that, uh, you know, there's people suffering, but, but we, in Western society and affluent places are doing okay. No, we're not. It's not working for, for any of us. And so at this moment, uh, I think a lot of us are really um, wanting to be liberated, wanting liberation from the stories that we've been living in and from the, 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 the state of being, the personhood that can exist in those stories. Um, so uh, this has been my optimistic streak that we are that, that there's a readiness um but oh my god just like the last the last year but especially the last 
week. Um, it's, uh, you know, sometimes it seems like maybe we're not ready and we just need another deeper round of the old story in order to really know what we're dealing with. So. Well, so let's just start with story because even in what you were talking about, there's, you you mentioned reality. <laughs> you mentioned a relationship to what your eye could see and feel and taste and touch. Um, and then, um, you know, there's, there is presence and then there is story. And, um, and so, you know, you, you look at like the unconscious under presence that, um, that affects how we experience the present. Um, so, you know, because part of what's happening, um, isn't a story and part of what's happening is happening in real time to alive people in ways that, like you said, the psyche can't understand because like to, to be in where you as an innocent person are just going to get burned to death or blown up or your child is going to get blown up. I mean, how does one continue with that level of fragility, right? That profound level of fragility that humans have worked for millennia to create capacities so that that level of violence can be tempered in some way. Living in a cave, having a fire, creating weapons, you know, like all the things through millennia, we have humans have created tools so that that moment of just being wiped out doesn't exist. So it's very deep in our psyche, that thing. It must be in our DNA in some way, back, 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 right? I mean, we know it from fight and fight and all the things that are there that we don't know are there except when they show up because we move into deep fears, which must be in constant engagement when you're watching that constantly in real time in this moment. So there's layers of stories. Um, there's the stories we protect ourselves with because our psyches can't um, take it. Um, there's um, protection for like who we are um, as a human in a world that demands us to be good or demands us to be a particular way that we have to tell ourselves stories because we can't bear not to be seen in a particular way. So, you know, Charles, you have explored stories, you, you know, in a philosophical way, which is the other thing the war economy does. It takes beautiful minds, <laughs> um, you know, and it engages them in the war economy, in the greed, corruption, distortion of the war economy. And, you know, I find it rare in, in these days to, uh, you know, like, if you look back hundreds of years ago, you know, intelligent people were curious about life and about our language and about the stories and about how do we live together and who are we actually and what is this thing that is life? And so, you know, just deepest gratitude that you take the time and the, um, uh, the space of no answer <laughs> because it's, you know, the question takes you into the deeper questions, but let's just start with story and your exploration of story. And what, what are some gems that you could leave for our listeners that kind of lay breadcrumbs for when we're not here, for them to start exploring just story in their own lives? Yeah. So maybe I'll, I'll say that, um, you know, you, you just mentioned a lot of different kinds of stories. Another another story is what you might call a theory of change or a thesis of change that says, okay, I see the way the world is and I want to change it and here's how I'm going to do it. Uh, here's the way change can happen. And a story will contain a role for yourself too and for other people. <clears throat> well, I 
<laughs> came to realize that I had inherited a theory of change that was actually part of the problem or aligned with the values and perceptions and assumptions that are also the, the scaffolding of the world as we know it, of the war economy. So I became, this is where, where I became interested in unlearning uh, because I didn't want to just reiterate the same programs that haven't really gotten us very far. I mean, if if we really had it, <laughs> okay, this is one way, this is one story, okay? But if, if we as the peace movement really <clears throat> had it nailed, then we wouldn't have had 30% more military casualties this year than last year. You know, we wouldn't still be doing this. We st wouldn't still be reenacting the victim oppressor drama, the us them drama that has fed every every genocide and every war since time immemorial. We wouldn't be doing that. So something isn't working here. Now, another story I could tell about it is that uh, it just hasn't come ripe yet. And we have not been doing anything wrong at all. But I mean, so my, my um, willingness to not know and to unlearn goes to that level uh, because I'm really sincere. You know, if if I want to, if I have been operating in counterproductive stories, then I want to know that. And that, you know, where does that sincerity come from? It's, I don't think it's something that 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 I've cultivated or that anyone cultivates. It's something that that direct experiences give to us. They humble us. So people, you know, go to. Um, I don't know, maybe they go to the West Bank, you know, or they they have a conversation with somebody who uh, lost a son to, to um, military conflict, or they're in a situation that confronts them so obviously that their story was wrong, that their belief was wrong, that they are rendered helpless. They're blown apart. Their, their story has been shattered, and that then that empty space allows a new story to emerge. So, you know, I've I've in my life been lucky enough to have some of some of those experiences quite early that just kind of made me a little bit wary of my uh, <laughs> the knowledge I had received, and even to hold lightly to the new stories that I that I uh, come on to. Uh, but I can identify, um, you know, one of the key pillars of the story that even on a subtle level um, can affect people working for peace, which is the basic organizational template of the world into good guys and bad guys. And the solution being that if we could, uh, if we could extirpate the bad people or the bad ideas or the bad institutions, then the world would be fine. Then we would have peace. We have to get rid of the, the those ruthless people, the warmongers, the, the greedy people, or those aspects of ourselves. We have to, in other words, go to war against something, war for the sake of peace. And so you hear a lot of military language in environmental and peace movements. You know, it's the it's we have to combat this, we have to campaign against that, you know, it's a battle, it's a struggle. And I'm not denying that sometimes it is actually a battle and a struggle. Um, but what I'm pointing to is the fundamental framing, the big picture framing of it in that way. Um, and so when, when we come at it that way, for me, there's a certain kind of hopelessness that arises because if it, if, if, if it's, you know, going to be a fight between Code Pink and uh, the Netanyahu government, for example. I mean, come on, who has the more weapons? Who has the more ruthlessness? You're not going to win a fight against them. So there's got to be another way. And that other way comes from maybe a different story about what the human being is, what the human being wants, what motivates us what 
are what what are are our true goals and incentives that might get hijacked or masked by the war economy and by the the way that it narrates to us who we are and i don't know that might seem really abstract but but maybe you want to pick up on the on that you're on mute thank you you've hit on some really good things so um you know from the beginning of code pink we 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 want to be peace activists so we don't believe anything happens like this um that's why our core goal is to be disarming and um you know what you spoke to is you know what do you do in the face of um, well, if I look back at philosophy, if I look back at where, where does it work and what was someone trying to say to me from the past that had really been looking at this, it's to not be silent. And what does that not being silent as a weapon doesn't serve. Um, and so, you know, and where, and also, you know, taking the ground out from something without creating the other ground, um, which is how I got to the war economy, peace economy was just like, yes, I'll, what I can do is take myself off the war economy. I can stop being used by it. And that's a practice, a daily practice when the war economy is the predominant system and culture you live in. But amazingly enough, there's a ton of things that you can do to not be in service to it. To start there, you know, is a lot because it, it, we empower what we hate, it's like, we are empowering this thing we complain about is, you know, kind of the thing I was saying. It's like, if you don't like it, don't empower it. Um, you know, don't give it energy. It's like, don't, you know, like we go to Congress to shine a light on what it is doing to make it uncomfortable when it's murdering people. Does anybody there think that they are gonna change Congress? No, they're very aware that they, they use the numbers when they're there of the billions of dollars that are funding these people to be in an addiction of serving war and militarism and violence and hate. So it's like more about like the relationship. Okay, I can know the story they live in and not only the story, but the drug that it is to their psyche that they're imprisoned by. You know, it so even we think having that relationship in our work helps make the work uh well for us, it is the antidote antidote to the horror that we feel. It is the antidote to how we would be feel helpless and disempowered that um, you know, it's it's how we can not be in the space of helplessness that it wants us to be but instead, or disempowerment, but instead of a place of agency. So what is your agency doing? Um, is it being used by a story or, and also, you know, you don't have to pick up a weapon, but you can't be silent. And, you know, we've, we heard that so many times through history um, from, da you know, I learned it from Dante to, you know, uh, uh, reading after World War II, it's uh, the complicity of silence. And um, being able to talk about it um, and finding the place where you can, you know, at, at Kuping, we say we, we, we know that we can't stop the war economy in this way. But what, we can, what can we do um, is becomes the next step. What is possible that, because also I would say that throughout history, education has been the other piece. And, um, you know, that we've throughout history, it's that space that takes us out of being used by a story, out of being violence has been education. Um, but, you know, we were being, <laughs> uh, so if we could go back to your unlearning piece, because education has been used as a tool for violence. Um, and so, because you also know things that you hold on to. Um, so in the an education project, what Part, I would say that what um, our local peace economy work is, is an unlearning, but in the unlearning, we have offered something to engage with that is a new habit that one chooses, you know, from the, you know, from the list of, of I choose to be that instead of, and that's a practice 
I would say structures are necessary for sanity. Um, you know, going back to the like, um, we choose the story for a structure, but also structures, but the structures all of a sudden are imprisoning us, how to make structures that are light. And even, you know, I'm just back from China and I'm so reminded when I go to Asia, how different the stories are from the West. Like when we say it's a different culture and how do we talk to each other is because they're living in a full on different story than, than we are. Um, that isn't about us versus them. That is about a self-responsibility. Like what is a, you know, a, a Chinese person says like, I'm responsible to myself to be self-responsible. I'm responsible to my family. I'm responsible to my community. I'm responsible to my state. I'm responsible to the world and I'm responsible to the planet. And that's where I make my choices from. Um, so even think of like, with you start with that as a young child and are educated into that system, you're already, because intelligence is about being able to hold disperse ideas um, in, you know, and, and let them all be true. Um, it, you're already educating yourself to the big, the, the wonder of it all and the, and the, the complexity of it all and more in relationship with instead of in war with, which good, bad puts us in war with, um, that's at the root of some of the Western cultures. Yeah, well, there's an awful lot I could say about, about all those things, Jody. Um, one, one of the things that I've noticed about stories is that they are, um, a, tell, to tell a story is kind of a creative act. It um, it can create the reality or something that co-resonates with the reality that you are prophesizing with the story. So for example, you know, you talked about China. Um, when, when one is very firmly in a story of, of us versus them, a story of competition for supremacy, uh, a story of empire, then it's very hard to actually understand multipolarity, which is where much of the world, if not most of the world is now um, moving toward. Um, it just from from the vantage point of you know the somebody uh, an ideologue in the U.S. foreign policy establishment, all this stuff about multipolarity just seems like a cover story <clears throat> for an attempt to supplant us as the hegemon. You, it's it's hard to even see it. Well, I then ironically and tragically, <clears throat> I, I like to say sometimes that it it takes two to make peace, but only one to make war. If we are so adamant in seeing enemies all over the place and are aggressive thinking that, well, we're just preempting them. You know, we're just striking first because they're going to strike us otherwise. Like from that position, we create the enemies that we're afraid of. Um, and the other and, and, and kind of mold the world into the image of that ideology. So, you know, this then so what can liberate us from it, and I really loved your point about um, the the uh, addiction to a story and to the adrenaline and the false sense of power that comes from it. Um, I think that, and, and I know that this is what Code Pink does. You know, you don't come to to the people who are holding the story of empire, the story of war, the story of us versus them, with uh, the attitude of "I'm going to take you down." It's actually an act of service to them too, because this this story is no longer a fit accommodation for the human spirit. It is, and maybe I'm over generalizing or being a little optimistic here, but I think that on some level people feel trapped in that story. They feel unfulfilled, um, and therefore. And that's why no amount of wealth or power can ever be enough. It's it's because it doesn't meet the real need. You know, how much how much money does it take to meet the need? It's a genuine need for security and belonging. If a billion dollars wasn't enough, is two billion gonna be enough? Is 10 billion gonna be enough? No. And how much power over the other, how much full spectrum dominance 
is going to meet the need for security. If what we have now hasn't met the need, no amount is going to meet the need. So then, so then you, you can come to people who are trapped in that story and with, with an attitude of generosity and kindness and say, oh, I know what you really want and here's a way to do it. And I think that, I don't know, sometimes when, if we're really able to um, inhabit that strongly, people can sense it. They sense that we're not a threat. We're not an enemy. And another part of them, the part of them that is the guardian of a particular story will instantly recognize you as a threat to that story. But there's another part of them that will that wants to accept you. And maybe the, the work of peace is to speak to that part and to nourish that part. And um, by, by many, many means. And, and some of them feel quite confrontational to the guardian of the old ideology. Because, you know, you're, and, and it is kind of an assault on that ideology in the sense that you're confronting it with a data point that just doesn't fit. It, it's just really hard to fit. But, you know, if someone really wants to, I mean, you know, I mean, I, 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 was, I, mean, I have some experience trying to, and I'm sure you have way, way more of trying to persuade people um, that their story about, you know, uh, plucky little Israel beset by enemies um, and anti-Semitism, you know, seeking to survive is, let's just say, not the whole picture. But any data point that doesn't fit that can be explained away if you are adamantly committed to maintaining your story. Any video, well, that was faked. Prove it. Prove that that wasn't faked. You know, any, any, um, what, what, what even constitutes evidence now, unless you take that person and put them or, or destiny puts them in a situation where something overcomes that, but it's not going to be a piece of video evidence unless they're already at a, at a point, um, of liberation. Yeah, and is that really, uh, you know, I guess for us, is that our task? You know, if someone is really locked in the power of their story, um, that's something only a relationship can affect. So, you know, as an activist, I'm always telling activists who want their great aunt Helena to not be so racist. And I'm just like, please drop that. Your inner, I would love your energy to be used for peace instead. And where, you know, it goes back to the, the thing about unlearning and learning and education. It's like where we get our stories from are from people we trust. Um, and, you know, it's so it's uh, even that, you know, for people in power, they you're already the enemy because you're not blowing smoke up their ass, basically. And if that's what they, you know, expect, then you're the enemy because you are not making me feel good because I am tied in knots all day long. I am out of integrity every second of the day. And I need somebody to tell me I'm okay because I am so out of integrity. That, you know, they have that going. I can't liberate that them from that. That's a that's a crack cocaine that you know takes you know medicine. You know it's just like that's that's a level of medicine. So you know when you can recognize that I always say a senator or a member of Congress they're on crack cocaine. We we as you know normal humans don't understand that crack cocaine because it's you, it's so distorting and you can see it when your friends become members and you're just like where did you go. And um, I can see, you know, when other people get power and you're just like, where did you go? Um, <laughs> I remember I used to say to Jerry, who wasn't a politician when he was governor for eight years, but became a politician after he was mayor. And he would say things I was like, where did you go? And he was like, you don't understand some politicians. We operate out of constant fear. And yes. he would tell me in the middle of it, he could not change himself. I was like, really, you're going to deny, you know, maids 
uh, that they only have to work up 40 hours. That's not who you are. I know who you are. I know who you care for. And you're just like, you know, when I'm in power, I serve, I serve that. And we operate out of fear every day. And he told me that while he was governor, he knew what was happening. He knew what he was behaving to, and he couldn't let go of it. So it comes back to us. And, and that's the part that's hard for everyone. What is our responsibility? And I think it's a little bit called living in an empire that um, creates empire culture and empire thinking that we don't even recognize inside of it. Um, but to be able to be in relationship, I think this is what you're teaching with unlearning is like, it still needs to happen in relationship because there are still things that we know that are essential. Um, and what are those? And what are the things that are keep us in a prison? You know, as you said earlier, the, the things to liberate. It's like, why do I, you know, read your book? Because you liberate my brain, you floss my mind. And, um, and I think it takes courage to be an optimist. You know, it's, uh, <laughs> it's they, they try to uh, make us wrong for being optimists instead of like, and that is, so I would say that's, one of the things I see as a responsibility because, you know, maybe not intentionally, they're not saying, oh, I'm just gonna make you all crazy. But, um, you know, when power is out of control and acting in ways that are insane, if, you're, if you don't have a community, if you don't have a way to disconnect yourself from power acting that way and create something else to do with your life, it's very disempowering and very, you know, so, you know, part of the, that's part of the unlearning is how do I take myself off of these forms of power that have been co-opted in ways that are, I can name, you know, I mean, look at, yeah. Luigi, you know, look at what Luigi did. And somebody said to me, I thought you were a nonviolent activist. And I said, I'm a nonviolent activist who understands, you know, liber you know, what, how liberation happens. And I can hold both of those ideas in my heart and body um, and know, you know, the power of each. Um, so if, you know, I mean, even in Buddhism, <laughs> uh, there is, um, if you can save the lives of 10,000 people, taking the life of one person is necessary. In philosophy, it's one of the great philosophy questions, right? If, you know, the train is coming in, in, in my, my philosophy class at university, you know, what happens when the train is coming? It's like, it's the great conundrum of life. It's, it's only yours to choose in the moment. Mm -hmm. And a human being chooses every day what they are going to do in response to the structure that oppresses. They will accept it, serve it, speak out about it, you know, like we, we all choose our relationship. Um, and, uh, you know, sometimes people choose the story because they think that's all there is. Uh, was it Ursula Le Guin that said, um, you know, that the, you know, everyone used to believe in the divine right of kings. Um, and the same way they believe about the war economy, you know, it's fragile, it's, it will fall apart as it fails people um but it will take the people to speak about it to educate others um not to take up arms but to educate others away from it and building something else because you can't it will have power until there is something to replace it you you mentioned uh so when you were talking about jerry brown i was thinking I mean, I would sure like to think that if I were in a position of, you know, institutional power, that I would not lose touch with my convictions. But <laughs> why do I think I'm any better than, you know, Jerry Brown or anybody? So, so you know. Well, but so the two people of Congress who can do it aren't rooted in power. Their roots are in their community. So yeah. Elon Omar and Rashida Tlaib are two members of Congress who can do it. But they look at the whole system as the horror that it is. They're mm -hmm. very aware of it. They are very aware they don't want to be part of it. 
They are very aware it could crush them at any moment. They are only relational and accountable to their communities. And both of them have very strong family, have very strong community. They come, you know, look at how much they win by, like APAC doesn't even bother, you know? Um, so it's, that's the peace economy. That's the thing I'm trying to say. It's like in, yep. in contradiction to that power is to take yourself off. You will literally have more power personally, relationally, communally, if you root yourself in your local peace economy. Um, you know, so uh, Corey Bush also, um, Jamal, they had deeper roots, but um, they also lived in communities that were easily told another story with $10 million that could make people uncomfortable about voting for them. You know, that they were new enough or not deep enough in the relationship of the community to be attacked. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you know, where where do I access my story and my relationship? If it's I'm accessing it from there, you'll you'll be owned by it for sure. No yeah. one yeah. you know, and and people who go into Congress and they don't have a really strong community that with whom they hold a counter cultural counter establishment story. You know, you step into that environment, it's really hard to hold a story, to hold a belief that is contrary to everybody around you. And they all think you're crazy. You know, like you actually have to have your own cohort. Uh, you have to have your own community around you to help you hold a story, to help you hold a reality, to help you hold sanity. And this is why I think it's, you know, you were saying also, um, you were speaking of the relationality of peace. Um, you know, it's not some add on. Uh, it's to me, it's absolutely essential. Like I cannot. I begin, to, you know, even unconsciously, I begin to question what I already know from direct experience. If I don't have others around me to sustain me to say, yeah, I remember, I remember I've, I've seen that, too. I've experienced that, too. You're not imagining things, Charles. You're it's real. Because this is simply human nature, and it's not even a bad thing. You know, if I see something anomalous, if I see something weird, if I see a UFO landing, the first thing I want to do is to get somebody else and say, do you see that? You know, because I, I know that I'm not trustworthy, not fully trustworthy. My senses can deceive me. I could be propagandized. You know, I could be deceived. So, the, the, so you know, belief is really a group activity. Holding a story is a group activity. And when uh, I can understand and, and, you know, forgive even when, when someone steps into this very powerful vortex of official ideology, if they're infected by it. And, you know, sometimes like, um, I mean, I saw it kind of working at me, you know, I, I, was, I was in the Kennedy campaign uh, with very, very high hopes and, um, you know, wrote, um, what I thought was a really beautiful speech on peace, you know, that he delivered. Um, and then October 7th came along and um, in my perception, he began to contradict uh, everything that was said in that speech. And it was very, very disheartening, demoralizing. There was still a lot about what he was saying about other topics that I resonated with strongly. You know, I still thought he would but it turned into like, you know, well, he's better than the other two candidates kind of thing. Uh, but, but I had this question. In fact, I, we, we talked about it a couple of times, I think, you know, should I stay? Um, and because I thought, well, like, yeah, I could leave, you know, self-righteously leave the campaign. Um, but is that really going to help the Palestinians? Maybe it will help more if I'm uh, you know, constantly there, present, um, articulating a different viewpoint and, and you know, having that inside of his ecosystem, his information ecosystem, and and fortifying others in the campaign who also shared my, my views. Um, but see, then it becomes like, well, okay, um, I can't be like just talking about that all the time. I would need to keep my powder dry for when there's a real receptivity. And 
you know, I published some some quite a number of of articles, uh, you know, advocating peace and um, uh, stating clearly what was happening, <laughs> but I noticed that that like it wasn't because I had changed my beliefs, but just the practicalities of being in that position made it um, for tactical reasons, for, for, you know, reasons of expedience made it not always the most useful thing to speak out. Um, and, and I could see how that bit by bit imperceptibly can very easily just turn into the complicity of silence. You know, and I just want to add that I put that in there as as a nuance because I think a lot of people in the establishment, even in in Congress, actually don't believe what they're saying, but they think, well, I have to say it in order to at least you know not get taken down by APAC, uh, and and to be part of the conversation, I have to at least feign uh, some level of agreement with its presuppositions so that I can be here, you know, in the system and exert an influence and maybe make policy a little less bad. Like, it's hard for me to, to, to denounce that as well, a they, wrong uh, approach. It, except yeah. it's what props the thing up. <laughs> right. So, so, you know, I will denounce it and um, because it is what props the thing up because some agreement is the agreement necessary to keep the violence going. And so, you know, everybody's, you know, members of Congress were telling us, well, I have to wait till the election is over so I can come out. You know, it's just like, that's, people are being violently murdered. You know, like your choosing, your choice has an effect on a real life. You know, so it's always in this moment for anyone. It's like, where does my, it's like, it it's always the choices about the moment when we put it off it is um where the story comes in so i think you've pulled in where does the story come in it be and you started out with this it becomes a, a protector for what i think i need to do um and so we live inside of these stories we tell ourselves that it's going to be okay it's going to be i mean like whoa with the climate movement is like full of what we call greenwashing of like but I just want to feel good about myself, what I'm doing the planet while I'm destroying it. You know, it's just like, there's, so it's, when do you come to the moment of, but that if I really, you know, and it's more, what am I here for? You know, I'm here for the liberation of the Palestinian people. I like, that's my whole 50 years of my life. Like I make every choice every day with that tuning fork. We all make decisions from a certain tuning fork of values, or many of us don't have any values I've learned and just we're used by everything. Um, and I think that's kind of what we were talking about members of Congress. Some of them just go and they're used by everything because they just wanted power and to be seen and they were filling an empty hole that will never be filled. And, you know, we, we know who they are. So, you know, it's like where, because life will teach you if you stay in relationship to value, it will not only teach you, but it turns you into a tuning fork of clarity. So, you know, your tuning fork of clarity has been about the question, the story, and now you're you're really spending a lot of time on, on learning. Um, and so, you know, in un, you know, in unlearning is a place we go into the unlearning is what are what is the tuning fork we're living our life out of? Do you know what I mean? It's like, how has that been cultivated by a story? Look at this. I mean, I I I deal with it with my grandchildren. Um, you know, just to see how imprisoned they are and how narrow their lives are as a person who grew up in the 60s, um, where they can't even, you know, it's like, grandma, I can't even relate to what you're saying. And if I did that, I would be not accepted. So, you know, you made a choice to be accepted around, you know, it's like, what are these choices we make to be accepted instead of to be uh, in the mystery, you know? And and it's, it's like, 
where will, because we know where this will take us, but we don't know where this will take us. Um, we don't know where, you know, you leaving and writing, you know, you would have affected history in another way, ha having done another gesture. Do you know what I mean? It's like the history. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, I, you yeah. know, I, I did continue to speak out. It's not like right. I, you know, kept silent in order to, you know, yeah. stay accepted. I thought, okay, if I, if I remain accepted while speaking out, that says something, you know, and, and, you know, my, my tuning fork is, I can't say that there's one thing. Um, I mean, I guess if I, if I had to say it's one thing, my tuning fork is to be to, is to serve the transition in our civilizations as basic mythology, you know, and, um, but there are so many things. Can that you say I, that again to, can you say to transform? To, to, to serve the transition in civilizations guiding mythology. Mm. It's very fundamental. And, um, you know, if, if you want to call me a philosopher, I guess that's what, you know, maybe a philosopher does as opposed to many other worthy roles. Um, but there are certain issues that I, that, you know, very specific issues that I, that I care about a lot, but that just for some reason get under my skin, you know, and, and Palestine's one of them. Um, uh, childhood is another one, like what we're doing to children. Um, you know, another one is, is uh, authoritarianism uh, and, you know, the way that, that it's, uh, and, and crypto fascism that's sneaking up in even sometimes in the name of combating fascism. Um, like there, there, there are certain things that a uh, uh, water <laughs> that have the health of water on this planet, you know. Um, uh, but all of those fit what you're talking. Ease. I mean, those are the pieces to yeah. be in relationship with that would, you know, connect to the underlying culture. You have to connect to some form of it. Right. And, and how does that relationship form itself? You know, minds around the war economy, when you look at it around water and how do you create this, you know, the mythological structure that holds us, you know, together as a civilization that cares for the children, that cares for the water, that, you know, liberates the oppressed, um, which, you know, goes to the Palestinians, crypto, crypto fascism and, and authoritarianism. Those are all tenets of how to live in a peaceful, liberated community of relationship. Those those are all those are all the places too where the oppression has attacked. Right. Advertising the water and denying the water. Like, you know, what we do to our children, uh, you know, I say that in the, you know in the United States, in Western civilization, inside of the us versus them, inside of the, you know, why do you talk about unlearning? It has a lot to do with how poorly our children are educated. Um, yeah, well, they're indoctrinated just as much as they're educated. Right. You know? Yeah, no education, right. Yeah, no, what I'm, what, I'm, what I'm really saying though is that, you know, because the effects of the mythology of separation are everywhere and in everything. You know, you have to choose some things. You have to actually, and that can be very personal. You know, according to what you've, what has impacted your life. You know, where you sit in the world, and, uh, you know, I guess I just, you know, kind of grapple with with um, this question of when to speak and what to say. Uh, you know, if I'm, say, speaking at a conference about, um, about, you know, radical unschooling or something like that, then, um, and I'm aware that, that there are people in the audience who, you know, are pro-Palestinian and pro-Israel, like, am I going to make it about that? And like, there's, of course... I don't know. Even the word pro-Israel is actually pretty ridiculous because what Israel is doing in the name of its own aggrandizement is actually destroying it. Um, but even some of these terms, I mean, this is another, now I'm really diverging, but but um, even some of the, the, the words that we use in uh, trying to serve peace actually feed the opposite. 
You know, they feed assumptions that aren't true. And, but what are you going to do? Not speak? You know, like, like, I mean, our whole language is pervaded by the story of separation. So this, um, I, I guess I bring that up uh, to invite and to allow a certain degree of perplexity and not knowing um, when it can seem, if you're very, very immersed in one of these issues, it can seem very, very clear, but it may not be so clear um, what to say, when to say it, who to say it to, um, when to speak, when to be silent. And that clarity, I think, comes from commitment. You know, it comes from the sincere commitment to somebody, because then, then you know the rational mind cannot make a set of guidelines, a set of principles that can guide you. It comes from that living connection to what you care about. And, and you know, in a way, it's beyond what would traditionally be called philosophy, where you try to come up with a set of ethical principles. You know, if it's more than 10 people, then, you know, push the person in front of the train to save those other 10 people or in such and such a situation. And let's make a whole set of fine distinctions that can clarify the ethics of it. You never actually reach the end of all of the exceptions and all of the gray areas. And, and this whole idea that we can reason our way to effective moral action is itself part of the, of the obsolete mythology um, that puts the, the uh, rational mind in a wrong place, you know, and, and um, devalues other functions of the human body that that in this moment of intense competing narratives, we have to actually source from. You know, we have to actually source from those ways of knowing that don't depend on which evidence to trust. You know, I, this is what I painfully experienced when I was with the Kennedy campaign. Um, evidence didn't help. It didn't help got nowhere with that, even went backwards with it. And it really opened me up more um, and more confidently to, to, to explore, um, you know, where, how, how and where do I really source information? And I mean, you named a big part of it, you know, the um, um, direct experience uh, and, and relationship. Yeah. So, um, uh, I'm, I'm thinking about the unlearning piece, which is like the part where we haven't been educated, but indoctrinated. Thank you for that. You know, that we think the education has happened. We think we're rational. We think, you know, we, so part of the story is even what we think the ground of being is um, that we're operating out of and operating in relationship to, I would say also. Um, so, and then, you know, I think of Ta-Nehisi Coates and, and their voice right now in this movement um, and how it was mainstreamed and then just taken off of mainstream for telling the truth and not allowing themselves to be bullied. But, you know, it came from a moment of a woman not being silent when he was like the pen ultimate best-selling book, you know, on speaking tours saying, was someone to stand up and say, you're lying. That's not history. You know, you've distorted it for your own needs. And the, that thread took him nine years through unpacking a story that he lived inside of. Um, and took exploration and took so with you know i looking at that it's like where also do we have the patience with others it's both having the commitment i love your word commitment to speak what we've seen that isn't in alignment with what they're saying in a way that is a generous offering and doesn't expect a result I think that's the other part of like being able to say something and not expecting a result, but, you know, saying it over and over again, wherever it is necessary of like, 
there's this story out there. And I'm, you know, I think that's what we do at Could Pink. We over and over again for 22 years enter the halls of Congress with bloody hands in the back of a hearing. Um, but what has happened is what it what the feedback is always is it does come back in some way and some, I mean, Mondo Weiss um exists because he saw me disrupt Bush at when at his inaugural and said, and he was a investment banker and he said what am I doing with my life like I want to disrupt power and Mondo Weiss has been an enormous tool in this moment you know with and you know like to take on something like Palestine when nobody's caring in 2005 and hone it to this tuning fork of usefulness right now it takes commitment and I think it's like when we each have to take the thing that alivens us you know, like you said, there's the big story, but we're in relationship to the story where we are. What is intimate? What can we commit to? What can we, you know, like we're our attentions, you know, just being able to commit to something, you know, whatever that is, and that it doesn't need to be big, that the big right. is what we, you know, thinking that the big is it or being crushed by the big, you know. Right. I'm, the first thing I do is like, no, like this thing right here, here we are together. What can we say to each other that becomes a tool in those moments where we're choosing? And mm -hmm. um, so uh, if there's anything you could share with our beautiful audience today about their own practice of unlearning as, you know, cultivating a peace economy is a daily, you know, unlearning, but it's more practicing peace um, because in the practice you're creating it if not within yourself but the community you live in which is a powerful nutrient to the soil of the war economy yeah i'll just yeah um i think you hit on something really important when you said it doesn't have to be big uh which leads me to say that part of the unlearning is to unlearn, I mentioned before, the theory of change that says that, uh, you know, it has to be, it has to look big to be big. The reason that I am engaged with what I said, you know, the, the deep mythology that guides civilization is not because I decided that that is the most high impact course I could take. You know, it's not like I said, well, that's at the root of everything, so I'm going to work at that. Um, it's simply because the circumstances of my life, my history, the particular configuration of gifts that I have suit me to that work. And that work is one of the things that needs to be done. But I am under no illusion that that's more important than the work that you know, you're doing in Palestine or that the work that maybe somebody who's you know, got physical disabilities and their scope of work is just in one household. Like any of these things have unforeseeable consequences uh, years or decades or generations down the road, you know, and there's part of me that understands crystal clear, like with, with crystal clarity that if peace could happen in Palestine, then it would happen everywhere on earth. No one would have any excuse and be able to say, well, you know, peace is impractical and peace is impossible. It couldn't happen. If it can happen there, it can happen anywhere. Therefore, if it does happen there, it will happen anywhere. And the entire cosmos will change. And that's true not only of Palestine, but of everything. Everything is a, a you know, a holographic microcosm of everything else. So I'd say that that and 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 I think this is important um, to unlearn that to unlearn the the um, ideology of of scale and impact and high leverage and all that way of thinking because it gets in the way of what is actually the most effective thing that you could be doing right now, which again comes from other sources of knowledge than the mind which, and I'm not anti-mind, I enjoy the mind, I like thinking, it's a lot of fun and it's useful, but it's not actually where decisions come from. They can feed decisions, but it's not where they really come from. They need to come from the heart. They need to come from the blood. They need to come from the bones, the gut, you know? 
And that, and we all have that compass. We all have that source of knowledge. But sometimes we second guess ourselves, we doubt ourselves, we deny the validity of that knowledge because there's some story running that says, well, what you're doing isn't making any difference. That what you're doing is futile because what does it matter you know, in the face of climate change? What does it matter in the face of, uh, you know, AI catastrophe, you know, or uh, uh, nuclear war or anything else? What does your work matter if it's just in one little corner of the world, if you're just, you know, working in, in one prison or you're just working in one community, in one neighborhood or one ecosystem, one doesn't even have to be a big ecosystem in one little corner of the world. Like we have this, very noxious ideology that says it doesn't matter and that you're not important, which isn't to say you're more important than anybody else, but it's you're freaking important, you know? Like own that and trust the knowledge that is unveiled when we unlearn these noxious programs that keep us passive and small. Thank you. I mean, that really nails, you know, what we try to teach at Local Peace Economy in the sense of um, that recognition of, okay, there is only this moment right now. What do I bring to it? And how do I serve the more beautiful world that, you know, that we can live in um, is just right here, right now with whoever is near us. And um, being able to do that with is that's we it's a profound thing and it goes to you know what we're witnessing in palestine is dehumanization you know at the core it is dehumanization and so and we know that it means you have to be already dehumanized to dehumanize another so i say if you know you care about the liberation of the palestinians humanize everyone you know let's just make that what we do like take the words of peace or everything it's just like because in humanizing each other, we create that connective tissue that creates the peace that we want to live in. That you know, it it it's that cares for the water and the children. You know, it 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 is. It's it's a ripple effect, and that there that to come back to the value of of human, the value of community. We've we've the value of community has been devalued. Also, humans been devalued, and the Palestinian life is not valuable. You know, like if I if I look at like what is the thing breaking my heart, then what do I do right here, right now? Um, because I have no levers on you know on stopping that, but I do have a lever on first of all serving my community in not being used by the violence, being engaged in a beautiful way together to raise up and not be silent, and then to figure out what in my community has been devalued. What has been dehumanized and how can I serve those needs? And starting small not only fulfills us internally, it creates a relationship to our community that is uh, deepening and empowering and fulfilling. And from that place, more knowledge comes. Um, and I call it knowledge in the sense that you speak, Charles. It comes from your blood, from your bones, from your gut, from your heart. And that is, you know, it, that it empowers that muscle for when choices are necessary. But we've disempowered, that muscle's been disempowered by the war economy inside of us. So our choosing gets owned by the war economy. So mm -hmm. just to, you know, choose your community, be together because we can't see each other, that we're held accountable and uh, mirrored in community is the great act of peace in this moment. Um, and it also makes you a much better organizer out in the streets, um, raising up uh, your love for the people of Palestine. So Charles, thank you so much for joining me today in conversation. Thank you for all you struggle with in, in this complexity of history that we live in um, and for your optimism, you know, just to mm -hmm. remind everyone that optimism is, you know, a practice and it, for me, it's my resistance against the darkness that gets thrown at us every day. And it's what serves our fellow community. It's what serves the community because it is that optimism that serves life and a future. And um, I, I hope for a future for all of us. Um, yeah. 
Thank you, peacemakers and peace lovers uh, for all you do in community. Um, thank you for being with us today. Um, and we look forward to seeing you again soon. Charles, thank you for your work. And I hope we can get together more often. Okay. Yeah, we love that. And thanks yeah. for Marie. Um, I, if everybody doesn't know what I've stolen Marie from Charles, um, and she was uh, in, you know, service to the story, uh, create, you know, creating the story that we can all live inside of with harmony. And now she's moved over to helping us. So I'm deeply grateful. Thank you. Thanks, Marie.